Learning about mushrooms. Learning about mushrooms. Learning about mushrooms, how they grow and what they do. Welcome to the Mushroom Mini Series on the Growing Joy Podcast. I'm Maria, and I'm obsessed with learning how mushrooms grow. And I'm Billy, Maria's husband, and I'm really excited to learn how we can use mushrooms to better our health and minds. Learning about mushrooms. Learning about mushrooms. Happy National Gardening Day, Billy. Happy National Gardening Day. For National Gardening Day, do you think it would be cool if we taught people how to grow mushrooms in their gardens this spring? I think it would be pretty cool. I think that would be pretty cool, too. (laughs) Let's do it! Welcome to the Growing Joy Podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Hi, Billy. Hi. How do you feel now that you're famous? I, I, I have no words. <laughs> you're growing joy famous, at least. Not real life famous, but how do you feel now that you're a co-host of the podcast officially? It's still pretty surreal. I feel really privileged to be on. I know I said that last time, but it, the, the feeling still persists. And honestly, it's just, it's really exciting. And you kind of forget that it's a conversation that's going out to so many people when you're so engrossed in what you're talking about. And mm-hmm. Louie really does provide that little wonderful feeling of like just feeling like you're having a conversation with an old friend. It really is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So for those listening, if you're new to the podcast, welcome. This is episode two of a mini series that we're doing. I'm Maria, the host of Growing Joy with Plants. This is my husband, Billy. Hello. He is my husband and a mushroom enthusiast. And a little pet project that we've been doing is this mushroom mini series where we are exploring the fantastic world of fungi. In partnership with North Spore Mushrooms, Louis Giller is our mushroom expert. He's joining us for all four episodes. He's such a brainiac. We love him so much. Yeah, he's the man. He's awesome. So this is episode number two. So if you haven't already listened, episode number one was an incredible Mushroom 101 understanding the world of mushrooms, how they grow, what they are, what they do for the forest, why they're like so integral into us being alive and why they're functional. And today's episode is all about how we as gardeners can grow mushrooms in our gardens. I'm so excited. Yeah, I think it's going to be an awesome conversation. And honestly, there's so much, it's such a deep topic and I don't know anything about it. So I'm really excited to learn as much as I can. Yeah. So for me, this was really interesting because I actually didn't realize that you could literally grow functional mushrooms like next to your tomato plants. Yeah, I think that the integration of mushrooms in a more traditional garden was one of the most surprising things. Yeah. Because I think that we always line up all of our seeds and we're like, okay, we got tomatoes and we got cucumbers. And now thinking that we could add mushrooms to that list is pretty fantastic. Pretty wild. Because we're shroomy. We love cooking with mushrooms. Speaking of, we started our grow kit. So we're growing mushrooms and we're little mushroom farmers indoors. I can't wait. I already have like four or five recipes I think I want to try and I want to try to dehydrate some after the fact and it's it's very exciting. I can't wait to see the first flush. Yeah, so we got the North Spore Oyster Mushroom Grow Kit. We also have the Lion's Mane one, but we're starting with pink oyster mushrooms. Cannot wait. It's a stupidly easy setup. You literally <laughs> just like open the box and spritz it with some water and mm-hmm. it comes with a spritzer. We set it up. It's sitting next to our kitchen sink and we're going to watch mushrooms grow. So follow me on Instagram, Growing Joy with Maria, to watch us growing mushrooms in our house. And if you would like to do it yourself, uh, North Spore offers a discount, which we'll tell you in a minute. Back to growing mushrooms in the garden. I thought this conversation was so cool. North Spore, and we're going to share links in the show notes, but North Spore has like the coolest test garden in Portland, Maine, where they're growing garden beds filled with mushrooms. It's uh, it's definitely on my list of places that I want to visit because yeah. I just think that, I think that it's such a robust area of gardening that I know nothing about. And I already know very little about gardening anyway. I let you take that specialty, mm-hmm. but I could see myself getting into this because there's something about sort of setting up this environment and then letting nature 
nature do its thing, which is really attractive to me. Yeah, it's really cool. And I love the idea of just having mushrooms at a reach to throw in everything the way, you know, we put basil and chives in everything when totally. we're growing it. And yeah. I'm so tired of buying those plastic containers of just like, kind, like you know, the white button mushrooms mm-hmm. from the grocery store. And I know, you know, every time you see uh, like mushrooms that are a little bit more exotic at like a Whole Foods or something, they're always incredibly you know, price prohibitive mm-hmm. uh, at some of those bigger stores. So the opportunity to be able to grow them right here and yeah. harvest them, and then possibly get a second flush out of it. It's just, it's really exciting. We're going to be mushroom farmers by the end of the series. <laughs> <laughs> I think we officially are because I we're growing we mushrooms. I know. Like, I that's guess all so. it takes. Right? But farmers, we're going to be growing a lot of yeah, mushrooms. Right now it's just enthusiasts. Our whole exploration is I'm interested in figuring out how mushrooms grow. You're interested in how they functionally affect your body. You might be able to hear Frankie tweeting in the background, my bird. I know you started taking the supplements. How do you like them? So the supplements have been nothing short of fantastic. I have been laser focused on just the lion's mane to start off. Mm -hmm. And I've really been enjoying just the clarity and the focus that I've, that I've gleaned from it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, what I started to do was I would have coffee every single morning and I would kind of get that jittery energy and it was kind of hard to focus on single tasks. I started taking the lion's mane and I noticed that my focus on single tasks really increased exponentially for me personally. Normally I would have about a 25 to 30 minute attention span before I had to take a break, move around or something like that. And I mean, I'm at 45, 50 minutes without stopping and I'm getting things done a little bit faster. And I do think that there's... It's kind of hard to explain, but it is that all of a sudden you just feel like like the world sort of broadens a little bit and you have this consistent energy and there's no jitters to it. So I'm drinking less coffee now too, which yeah. is a benefit for pretty much for everybody. You. <laughs> and you are like an insane coffee drinker. Yeah. So that's the lion's mane tincture. Yeah. So, it's fantastic. Yeah. I've been putting it in my coffee and I really enjoyed it. So that's been kind of fun too, to explore how they're affecting us in addition to growing. So we're going to dive into this conversation with Louie. Louis Giller, he's our mushroom expert and he works at North Spore Mushrooms. They're our partner for this mini series. So they're giving us, they're lending us Louis for, you know, all four episodes because we wanted experts to teach us how to do this. We didn't want to spread fake news. And also the cool thing with North Spore is they're like a one stop shop for all mushroom growing desires, whether you grow in your garden, whether you grow indoors. So plant friends, if you want to join us on our mushroom shroomy shroomy journey, North Spore is offering you a coupon code of 10% off growing joy is the coupon code at northspore.com. I am so excited about this interview. You're going to see me I kept just like asking so many follow-up questions to Louis cuz he was blowing my mind that you could like literally grow mushrooms next to your tomato plants. I'm so excited to experiment. We're so excited to experiment because I think that it's going to provide us, you know, even more diversity to our garden this yeah, upcoming year. And, and it's, it's actually cool. something that I'm willing to help out with, which oh, is... Shit. Well, at the end of the episode, <laughs> we're going to talk about what our plans to grow in our garden. So stay tuned. But without further ado, here's Louie. Welcome back, Louie. Hey, Louie. Great to be back. Hi, guys. I'm so stoked, I mean, in general about the Mushroom mini series that we're doing, but specifically for this episode, because there's such an overlap that I, as a gardener, didn't even understand between the mushroom community and the gardening community. And that's that we can grow mushrooms alongside the vegetables and herbs and berries and fruits that, you know, we tend to all year and give all of our love to, but we can be doing that with shroomies too. I had no idea. Yeah, you absolutely can, and you should. The mushrooms are out there anyway. They're popping up in your garden no matter what, just like plants, just like weeds, and we can control some of that. We can direct it and facilitate soil creation through beautiful and delicious food. Before we dive into all of the nitty-gritty of how, because I want at the end of this episode for everyone to be so lit up about growing mushrooms, that we're all growing a a network of mushrooms around the world. Why grow mushrooms in in a garden? Well, I'm glad you asked. Mushrooms are a fantastic food source, an important food source. We often have waste materials available to us in a garden that can be used to grow mushrooms, and they are able to grow on these things that will break down faster because of it and have a higher microbial content, and better benefit the plants, make nutrients more bioavailable to plants. They're also beautiful. I think they add an incredible aesthetic element 
to gardens. So it's a great food. They benefit plants. Uh, they're cool looking. What more do you want? I love that. In our last episode, we talked about, you know, the mycorrhizae that help plants actually uptake all the nutrients and water. So it's great to think that you can actually double down and inoculate your garden. And is inoculate the right word if I say I'm inoculating my garden with mushrooms? Yes, you're inoculating your garden. And what you are using is spawn. So you could even just say I'm spawning, you know, sort of like the same terminology with like fish. Spawning is a verb. Okay. So who spawn? It's kind of like that's why we call the genetic material spawn. Anything that is going to be used to inoculate is spawn. And it's mushroom spores that get put into the spawn that then you're putting in the soil. Should we have a quick vocab lesson? These are very important terms and they are specific. Everybody thinks that we use spores a lot, understandably. People know that mushrooms produce spores and we are called north spore, but we never use spores. We, just like a fruit orchard, we like a specific strain and we want to keep those genetics so we don't work from spores. Otherwise, you have new combinations and new things appear. We find something we like and then we do tissue culture. So we are almost always extrapolating tissue onto new food sources. You can't do that forever and you do need to grow the thing out and uh, the mushrooms out and take new tissue. And people do work with spores, but for the most part, our wine cap spawn, for example, which is one of our favorite strains and favorite species, that is a clone. All the wine cap grown by the people who buy it and use it in California are it's the same wine cap being used in New York State, exact same organism. Hope that helps clarify when you're, you're just spreading it onto new food sources. Yeah. So it's like propagation. Like, so if, cause tissue culture you hear about in the houseplant world too, it's a form of propagation. So if I have a plant that I want to share, I clone it and then give it to a friend or these people who are, you know, doing tissue culture of like the most popular plants are ensuring that you get that same plant or the same variegation of that plant. That's really appealing. So it's the same. So when you're buying spawn, you're kind of buying a propagation of mushrooms that you already know are nutritional, non-toxic, you know, non-poisonous, that kind of stuff, instead of getting the spores. That's interesting. I have a question off of this. Because this is essentially the same organism that's having an opportunity to grow and take over new food sources, right? Does that mean, and I know this is a little off topic, but just in terms of the genetic makeup of like mushrooms, do these mushrooms have different DNA just like plants and animals do? Or is it really just cell copying? Are we seeing one central organism that just kind of grows? And so if you were to take samples from it in different areas, it would all have the same exact genetic makeup. That's a very good question. And I'm learning more about this all the time. Even though there is no sexual reproduction, there are still genetic anomalies that happen throughout time, no matter what. So when you take something out of deep freeze and you put it on, on new food, and then you put that on new food, we refer to that as generation. So our spawn is generation two, because we've taken an agroplate, uh, which is just a nutrient gel that we've thrown the mycelium on. We take a little piece of that and put it on some grain. And we take that and we extrapolate that bag of grain onto maybe 30 more bags of grain. That first bag is that Gen 1, and the second bag is the Gen 2. Are the 30 bags all considered Gen 3 then? Or are they all you know Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, all the way to Gen 30? Because there'll be some differentiation. They would all be Gen 2. But if you kept going and you kept using those bags, you would get a weakening in the strain. You can't just transfer forever. Okay. That is a an interesting element. The mycelium doesn't just go forever. There's certain limits that the organism has built into its DNA. Gotcha. So then at that point, is the end of a mycelium the fruiting of a new mushroom cap? And then like is would that be the like the fruit from a tree in the sense of you can then take that mushroom cap, maybe take a spore print and then start from square one? If you want to get that exact the trait. From that specifically, you would take a tissue culture okay. from that mushroom. You would split it open and take a piece of the middle and you would culture that out. But you could also take a spore print and those spores would have those genetic characteristics 
but it would be a spectrum of those characters. Gotcha. Okay. You would be taking a phenotype, right? You would be like, oh, okay. Of all the mushrooms that grew here, this looks the best. This has the best traits. And I'm going to take that. And, and, and yeah, I might, I might just do it by spores because then you get more to choose from ultimately when you're doing your breeding, if that's what you're up to. As we let that sink in, that nerd moment sink in, I want to go back <laughs> to some more high level questions before we keep, yeah, I, we're going to keep wanting to dive into the intensity. So today's episode is growing outdoors, how to grow mushrooms outdoors, perfectly timed. April, we're all thinking about, you know, getting outside, getting our plants in the ground. What kind of mushrooms can you grow in soil? So actually, most of the mushrooms that we offer and that are grown commonly don't grow in soil. That's sort of the bottom line. You're going to be able to combine things with soil and utilize soil. But for the most part, you can't just introduce any of these mushrooms to soil and grow it. Most of these are wood lovers that are going to prefer a hardwood substrate or straw or some woody garden material. There are a number of them that like manure or good compost. A healthy, rich soil can be added to some degree, or used as a top dressing at times and, and really benefit things. But ultimately, you're putting new material on top of the soil and helping to build it. Okay, so it's not um, as simple as getting your spawn and just throwing it into your soil. You've got to tinker your, with your soil or some areas of your garden a little bit in order to set yourself up to grow mushrooms. But I can grow a mushroom right next to my tomato if I want to, in theory. Yes. There are no known, like, negative associations or interactions that I've ever heard of. Companion planting is sort of kind of like what you're getting at there. And I have no knowledge of any, any mushrooms that shouldn't be grown with any plants. On the contrary, we still don't know a lot about what mushrooms might coexist best and be cultivated best together or together with plants in the best way. There's just not a lot that's at least been written and published in that regard. Okay. And then in regards to plants being annuals and perennials, are mushrooms annuals or perennials? Is it, do you have to inoculate your garden bed every year? Is it a set it and forget it moment where you, you inoculate it once and you can potentially be getting mushrooms for years to come? If you set up a really good bed with slow digesting materials, right, not just straw, for example, Although straw is great, again, a mix of like hardwood though in there that's going to be digested more slowly. A bed can last a few years, depending on species. The archetype is wine cap, the hero of the bunch. And wine cap beds can totally last two or three years. Typically, not often more than that, although they'll pop up. They, they are really good at kind of spreading themselves out and popping up in other places on people's properties. But what you can even do though, is when you have a bed and it's colonized, is you could take a chunk of that bed and you could spawn elsewhere with a chunk of that bed. Whoa. But uh, every couple of years, you are going to need to add more spawn and more nutrition and work it in. And when you're referring to bed, do you mean a garden bed that already has other plants in it? Or do you mean a specific mushroom bed? It can absolutely be either. And I think it's better if it's a garden bed. And the big reason for that, in part, well, there's a, a few reasons. You're helping to build soil, but you're also growing plants that are going to provide shade for the mushrooms and, and a microclimate, higher humidity around the mushroom, uh, around the plant. So it's definitely important for most of these species to not just be like completely bare in the baking sun. They will get fried. It can make harvesting them before that happens difficult. Yeah, I think that's actually really exciting for gardeners because all of us have some ass some shady area of our garden that is like, you know, the neglected child or whatever cuz you know, gardeners who are growing edibles want that 6 to 8 hours of direct light and shade is actually a real inconvenience. So I love the idea of taking the shady aspect of shady area of my garden and making it my mushroom sanctuary, my mushroom area. Yeah. A lot of people do that. They take, you know, it's low lying, it's off under a pine tree in a corner of your garden. Yeah, that's the spot for your mushroom bed. And when you inoculate a bed, the mushrooms don't grow right away. It takes time. And if you inoculate and you plant your 
plant, by the time those mushrooms are ready to grow, it can line up very nicely that those plants are larger and are ready to provide that fit. But initially, everything's happening within the wood chips and within that bed, and it doesn't doesn't need that shade initially. Ideally, it's got that shade naturally from trees or something. If you are looking to bring the beauty of outdoors inside this April, you've got to check out Soltex Full Spectrum Plant Lights. Plant friends, their stylish lights provide all of the necessary photosynthetic rays to grow and maintain a variety of plants from cacti to monsteras. With Soltech, you can add a touch of spring to any room, especially those lacking natural light. We all have that room that we know would look so beautiful if plants were in it, but it's too low light for plants to survive. This is where Soltech comes in. Their warm white light is perfect for growing houseplants, and their range of solutions include bulbs, track lights, and the famous American-built aspect pendant light. I have used both their Vita Grow Bulb and the Aspect Pendant Light in my home, and I can say that they are both incredible. No one ever knows that they're plant lights because they're so modern and beautiful and sleek looking, and they keep your plants so happy. I've had Figaro, my fiddly fig, under the Aspect, and he's doubled in size when under him. I have the Vita Grow Bulb in a desk lamp in my office, and they illuminate my office plants. The lights also come with a timer, so you can just set them and forget them. When I lived in New York City, we had one of the aspect pendant lights over my lime tree, Limey, and sometimes we set them to end at 10 o'clock, and if we were still in the living room, the light would go off, and that would be the cue to say goodnight, Limey, because of the timer that it came with, which we loved. But don't take my word for it. These lights have thousands of five-star reviews. Soltex products speak for themselves, plus they back everything with a 90-day money-back guarantee. 90 days, that's impressive. So you can purchase with confidence. Upgrade your plant's environment with Soltech because better plants deserve better lights. Visit them at soltech.com and use the code BLOOM15, that's BLOOM15, for 15% off your purchase at soltech.com. Once again, that's code BLOOM15 at soltech.com for 15% off your purchase. All right. So I recently got back from three and a half weeks of travel and plant friend, I felt so bloated and uncomfortable. You know, when your pants are just too tight (laughs) and you feel so lethargic just from all the travel and the indulgent meals, I was so excited to get back into my kitchen and kick off my journey to healthy eating with the most delicious healthy meal delivery program out there, Saqqara. So if you haven't heard of them, Saqqara delivers science-backed plant-rich nutrition programs and wellness essentials right to your door. They're ready to eat meals and nutritionally designed to deliver results from weight management and eased bloat to boosted energy and clearer skin. I just finished the three day program and plant friends, I feel so freaking good. And I already miss their delicious meals because they delivered three days of meals, three meals a day. Every single meal was more delicious than the other. And I wasn't expecting that because they're all plant based. I kind of thought it was going to be salads, you know? No. There was one night I had a burger. One morning I had this delicious tapioca pudding for breakfast. I had pancakes for breakfast one day. The recipes, the meals were incredible. Chef's kiss. And I did the program Monday through Wednesday. And on Thursday, I was out to drinks with friends who hadn't seen me for a month because I had been traveling. And my friend pulled me aside and she said, what the hell have you been doing? You look amazing. You're like radiant. And I realized, oh my gosh, I just finished my three-day Saqqara program. I wonder if that was it. I do feel like my skin feels good, my body feels good, my body feels lighter, the bloat has gone down that I was experiencing, but more importantly, my spirit feels incredible. My spirit feels brighter after eating such high-quality foods for my body. So if you're looking for a healthy eating kickstart, a three-day program, a lifestyle shift, a cleanse, Sakara's got the delicious meal program for you. Right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order. Yes, you heard me, 20% off your first order when you go to sakara.com slash growing joy or enter code growing joy at checkout. That's sakara, S A K A R A dot com slash growing joy to get 20% off your first order. Sakara.com slash growing joy. <music> This brings up a question that I had because I was thinking about sort of picturing in my head a bed with like lots of low hanging plants and mushrooms popping up all over the place. 
And then I was thinking about how mushroom, you know, different mushroom species, some of which can be beneficial and edible and some which can be poisonous. Sometimes they'll look really similar. When you have a colonized bed, what are some of the, I guess, protection that one species will have against another species coming in on such a ripe food source and then confusing the farmer? You know, like, like how do you protect against that? So a lot of hard work has gone into producing spawn. That's where all the sterility happen, you know, is happening in North Spore's facilities. We are making sure that there is a single individual in there and it's clean and it's dense and thriving. When you introduce that spawn, you're doing it at a high rate and it's ready to grow. It's not growing from spores where one in a billion spores has success. It's already ready to jump off and has such a, a high success rate because of that. So just knowing that you have spawned at such a high rate can give you confidence that if you see a mushroom grow, a large mushroom, it has a high probability of being what you planted. But other things are out there and other things could grow. Your mycelium could have failed early on and it could be something else. But it really comes back to just being like plants in that regard, you better know what a tomato looks like if you're growing mm -hmm. a tomato. Familiarize yourself with the species that you're growing. Try to find photos. Uh, we have a bunch on our website of mushrooms going through their life cycle. That's an important aspect of, of growing things. But, you know, be 100% sure before you consume it. And when it comes to high level, like the life cycle, you had mentioned, you know, if you inoculate your garden beds... Say I decide, oh, I want to grow mushrooms this year, this season. Is this something where I'll have a win and I'll be able to harvest a mushroom this year if I try this summer? Or is this something where there's a year of inoculation and then I'm only going to start seeing fruiting bodies next year? You can have mushrooms the year you plant, for sure. Log cultivation, things take longer. And you're usually looking at at least a year. But with beds, it's several months. Definitely. When you inoculate wine cap, oysters, chestnuts, what have you, in the spring, you would expect on average about two or three months for that mycelium to get up to desired density and then for conditions to be right on a nice rainy, the day after a nice rainy afternoon, you know, um, mushrooms might start to pop if conditions are, are proper and you can have multiple crops in a year for sure. That's so exciting. It's crazy to think well, about too. And so I know you said that no mushrooms can grow in soil, but when we're thinking about what we might inoculate our garden with, what are the types of mushrooms that you recommend like beginner people to try growing? So I just want to touch on that for a sec. It's not that no mushrooms can grow in soil. We see mushrooms in lawns all the time, right? And though some of those mushrooms are mycorrhizal, meaning that they have relationships that are specific to the plants around them and we really couldn't cultivate them, but some of them are actually just consuming dead grassy material. It's possible to, there are a lot of species that we don't work with that could, there's one called saggy mane that can be cultivated, and it's a delicious mushroom. It, it doesn't keep very well. It's known as an inky cap, but if you have saggy mane in your yard, you could potentially take specimens, blend them up, and, and pour a slurry over different parts of your lawn and try to spread that mushroom into new areas of your yard. But if we're setting up our beds to be a mushroom-friendly garden, what are the best like beginner mushrooms to try growing alongside our, our fruits and vegetables? The wine cap should always be considered. It's very aggressive. It's very versatile. It can handle a lot of different conditions. Various oysters, pink oyster, golden oyster, blue oyster, Italian oyster, to definitely be considered chestnuts and even namacos, two closely related, very delicious species, to be considered on manure, almond agaricus, to be considered, and on a mix of manure and hardwood, uh, leaf litter is a really good, and leaf mold is a very good addition to a uh, bluet bed. Bluets are really delicious mushrooms that. He really likes cold weather. I've never even heard of these yeah, mushrooms. I want to taste all of them. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, they're good. And what about space? So say I want to try, how much can I grow? You know, if I have a small planter of basil, can I inoculate it with some spawn, another S word, or do you need a certain amount of space to really get a good harvest? There is a uh, critical mass that's helpful, but it has a lot, I think, to do with moisture retention. You could definitely grow successfully in a flower pot. You would add those tips or straw or a combination of those on top, spawn it with some grain spawn or sawdust spawn, keep that watered, and that could absolutely colonize and produce mushrooms right there. It could even um, ultimately help break down and benefit the plants. You do have to have to make sure to have that balance, right? You don't want to be overwatering. The mushroom substrate may want more water than the plant wants, and that could cause you problems. So you got to balance those things. I have a quick question that this brought up, actually, another sort of geeky question. I'm thinking about earthworms, right? You're talking about how mycorrhiza will, will break down this material into more digestible uh, pieces that they can use the nutrients from, right? Do like other organisms that help break down you know, and help decompose soil. Do they compete with mycorrhiza or do they work in tandem? So like, are the worms actually able to eat through mycorrhizal networks and use that as part of their nutrient base? Or are they eating what's left over from the mycorrhiza or vice versa? I'm going to make a claim right now that I haven't read copious um, research on, but it's based on my broader understanding. I would say that uh, healthy mycorrhizae in soil is critical for the health of worms and critical for the immune systems of those worms. It's part of healthy soil. They like healthy soil. It's going to be good for them. There is a ton of competition and cooperation throughout the the ecosystem as you zoom in. You know, it's just, it's incredibly complex throughout that. And, and worms are a critical component of it. They're spreading spores, for example, and spreading tissue possibly as they move throughout the soil. You know, in a bed, you can have, you know, the leaf litter and all and leaf mold and all in the straw and everything. And you can throw some earthworms in there too to most closely represent an ideal environment where everything's working in symbiosis together. Yeah. Ideally, if you're a gardener and your garden beds have, you need those earthworms and garden beds to aerate your soil yeah. and help with the roots and water. It's going to help break things down faster. You have many different types of decomposers and the mushrooms are one of them. And they're going to help break down that material so it's useful for all those other things. But again, the big benefit is that we can eat them. Hell yeah. I'm so (laughs) excited. Okay. So I want to dive in. Now there are multiple ways with different like difficulty levels that you can grow mushrooms in your garden. We're going to go over different ways you can grow them in your mulch, grow them in your garden bed, grow them in your paths. We're going to talk about inoculating logs, which is a whole different thing. That's I feel like that's like mushrooms 2.0. But overall, like what are the materials? What's the barrier to entry? You know, what do we need? What's our shopping list? Yeah, what's our shopping list before we start, you know, planting? Number one is your spawn. You're going to need that genetic material. That's the most important thing. You can't grow any of of these mushrooms without that. So you're going to need your spawn. And at home, you will need hardwood chips, but those can be hard to find. I often recommend reaching out to your, uh, your town or city, the arborist and landscaping companies, just kind of hunting that down. It can be difficult, though. So the other option would be straw and any kind of uh, grain straw will do very nicely. Then you can make a bed. If it's chopped straw or you can chop it even better, smaller particles that are going to compact are better. Because if you have big, long pieces of straw and they're kind of balanced up against each other, you may have big cavities. And if there are big cavities, the mycelium won't be able to form densely enough to form fruit nicely. Gotcha. Okay. So the spawn has the genetic material and the mushrooms are going to grow on the straw or the wood chips. So the mushrooms aren't growing in our soil as we've discussed, but we need to just as gardeners have a little bit of something in there to help the mushrooms attach and grow and establish. Yeah. And as I mentioned, there are a number of situations where adding like an inch or two of soil as like a a live and active kind of microclimate casing layer 
could be really beneficial and add some nutrients. Doing that with a wine cap bed could be a really, really helpful step. Got it. The magical feeling of hearing the deep, moving resonance of a Wind River chime in your garden is... It's magical. I can't think of a better word. We hung two Wind River wind chimes on either side of our house in January, so it's been several months, and I still smile at least once a day when I hear them singing in the wind. I'm recording this in my office, and there's one literally singing to me right now as I record this ad. If you're looking for a new way to grow mindful moments in your life, I can't recommend these chimes by Wind River more. They're thoughtfully crafted, they come in an array of colors, and a wide assortment of different sounds. So take a listen to this one. With birthdays and holidays coming up, like Mother's Day and Memorial Day, a wind chime is a perfect gift because every time the recipient hears the gorgeous chime singing in the wind, they will think of you and be gifted a moment of calm. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Plus, Wind River is offering a free engraving on all of their Corinthian bells for Growing Joy listeners. So to get that, all you have to do is go to windriverchimes.com to listen to all of the melodious options, pick your favorite melody, pick your favorite color, and then at checkout, use code growing joy to get a free engraving once again that's windriverchimes.com then use code growing joy at checkout for a free engraving windriverchimes.com so let's start with i feel like maybe let's go from easiest or lowest hanging fruit to like highest hanging fruit in terms of the activity that the gardener is going to have to do. So to me, what seems simplest is growing, you know, most of us use mulch in our gardens at the top of the season, especially. So you can grow mushrooms in your mulch. That's so cool. Especially a lot of people put straw on top of their garden to cover and prevent weeds. How cool is that, that you could grow mushrooms in between all of the plants? So if I wanted to try that, how would I grow mushrooms in my mulch. So you are going to do a pretty simple process. You're going to make mushroom lasagna, basically, uh, spawn lasagna. You're going to put down uh, some of that woody material, uh, that some of that straw uh, in a, a couple inches, and then you're going to sprinkle spawn on top. You, you know, you don't need to be scared. Just put your hand right in the spawn and crumble it nice and fine over about a 15 to 20 square foot area is is what our spawn is designed to cover. And you want to make about three layers. So so after that spawn, you're going to do another layer of of the straw and then another layer of spawn and end with straw. And so you end up with eight inches or so, a deep bed. That's really nice. It's going to be able to colonize uh, completely and it's going to have a good density to hold water. And that's really critical during those first few weeks is keeping it very well watered. Okay. So I'm going to make my mushroom lasagna. I'm going to water it in. And then in terms of maintenance, yeah, like that. So is the only thing that I have to do is make sure that that's damp? Because I guess if we're thinking about mushrooms in the forest are growing in that damp kind of understory of the of the forest. So we've got to replicate yeah. that. So is the key to just keeping that nice and moist? Yeah, you want to make sure it has drainage and there is no standing water. You don't want this soaking wet to the point that it's getting super moldy or it's getting anaerobic. So it it should be draining. But you want to make sure if it doesn't rain, you know. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to. And I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend, go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts 
podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. Outside where you are in two, three days, you know, find their hot days, you should be watering it. I might venture to say, actually, during those first few weeks, you know, really just make sure it stays moist. That is, I think, when most beds fail is those first few weeks. If you set your bed after three, four weeks and you, you, all you have to do is dig a little hole and you don't see mycelium, you should see a thick white network of fungal material, right? It's not a mushroom. If you don't see that, it probably didn't work. And you don't need to wait three months to know if this has taken. Well, this is another like perfect marriage between gardeners and mushroom growers because we have to be monitoring the moisture of our garden, especially in that first month anyway, because the plants need moist soil. But the plants also can't be drowning in, you know, it can't be overwatered. So it sounds like that's a very interesting method. It also sounds like eight inches of straw as a gardener makes me a little stressed. Normally we're mulching like one or two inches, but the other thing that you guys recommend is actually doing it in the paths in between your beds or almost as like edging on the outsides of the bed um, of the garden bed where you can kind of build up a little bit more straw or like bookends. like bookends. Mushroom bookends. Yeah, little mushroom <laughs> bookends to each bed. I love that idea. Having like little mounds or even trenches going along beds is something people do a lot or people will inoculate straw bales with oysters works really well and will utilize straw bales. You definitely can use less. You know, like I, I was talking about eight inches. That is not the only way to do it. If you just take spawn and sprinkle it over and just work it in with your hands, that can work. And some of these, like almond agaricus, that is really going to prefer, you know, four or five inches of a manure-based rich compost some plants are really going to love that and the fawn should go in in chunks like egg sized chunks in like a diamond pattern so that there is even colonization and that again can be covered with a little bit of a casing layer of woody material but yeah it's not going to work directly around certain plants it can work in the pathways very well so I actually had a question here because now, obviously, I'm not the gardener. Maria is, and she does an amazing job. But I remember a greenhouse that we visited, and they were talking about how they plan out all of their different plants for sunlight. You know, some of them have much lower hanging leaf structure, and, you know, some are a lot higher. Does it make sense in order to retain as much humidity and moisture as possible say we're doing like the mushroom bookend thing, to have something with a low hanging canopy to kind of further shield those mushrooms at the end? Or could you have something with very low canopy, like a tomato plant or something like that, that might climb? You know, would the mushrooms do better with something that's that's a little bit denser, closer to the ground? Some shade. Yeah, yeah, with some shade. Yeah, the more shade, the better. Those broadleaf plants, squash and cucumber and things that are going to have those big leaves that can provide a lot of shade. And get pale, all sorts of things that are going to have broader leaves and more direct shade are going to be better companions in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> That's so cool. Talk to me about straw bales. I thought that was interesting. I was thinking maybe for us to try that this year because the straw bale seems as simple as, you know, literally bringing a straw bale home and shoving some spawn in it and watering it. Yeah. This step is not 100% necessary, but you can give yourself an advantage, especially if you have maybe material that isn't the cleanest. You can take straw and you can pasteurize it. For the most part, you don't have to do these things for outside, but it could help. And so I want to mention it. You can get agricultural lime, which will raise the pH. And so a lot of farmers may have this stuff anyway, but you may need a lot because you, you would dunk the straw in a bucket or in a bin and add agricultural lime and water till the pH is about 12.5. It's very basic and it is going to uh, kill a lot of microorganisms and basically give you a chemical pasteurization. And so you would um, take that straw out. You're going to drain that straw on a grate or in an onion sack. And we have a walkthrough on this method on our website, by the way. This method then gives you a clean material. You can mix 
oyster spawn into that. And it gives the oysters an advantage to jump off from when you put down all of that uh, that material. But you don't have to do that. We took regular straw bales and had plenty of success growing various types of oysters just by taking a PVC pipe. We cut it at an angle and stabbed it in so that you could get grain spawn into the middle, like a funnel, just to get the spawn into the crevices easier. And then we just inoculated in in a bunch of different spots and kept the bales watered. Is there a rule of thumb for like how, when you're inoculating a bale of hay, like how far apart each insertion point should be? Not really. Just think about it as the mycelium is going to move in a 3D fashion. And so you want to inoculate even distances apart around the whole thing. That's really the way to think about it because you will get faster, more even colonization. If you just go from one end, from one spot, it's going to need to move through all of that material going all the way to the other end. And it perhaps may want to do that before it even, because that when it kind of completes an area, that's a signal to it to, to produce mushrooms and go find new pastures. Now, I know that if we're dunking things in a lime-based solution, it's going to kill a lot of, like, let's say, mold spores, right? But if we're outside, that's something that we can't really control as much. What is the competition like between mold and mycorrhizal networks? From what I understand, you've actually seen mushrooms in my refrigerator get a little fuzzy and maybe even get a little moldy. So it doesn't look like they're, from a complete novice's perspective, that they're good friends. But how do they work together? And if we're in damp, dark environments, I know for a fact that things can get moldy and mildewy in those too. So how does that work? (laughs) That's a complicated question that I definitely don't know all the answers to. But immediately what comes to mind is the idea that A lot of molds are really important for plants and are performing mycorrhizal functions. So one pathogen that we are constantly battling as mushroom farmers is trichoderma or trichoderma are are often added as an additive in soil. And it's good for plants and it helps plants with their nutrient needs. But it's a very dastardly mold for mushroom farmers. So kind of separating the two as opposing forces is sort of, I think, not the right way to look at it. Sure. Okay, that makes sense. Right, because they're living in harmony in nature, I guess. Yeah, and there are definitely a lot of mycorrhizal species that are in harmony with mold and in balance with mold. They're not necessarily battling. Another point to make is that a lot of times there is a succession involved. Molds will come in later, perhaps, as a primary decomposer. When um, a tree is dead or dying, for example, you might get a mushroom colonizing that material, that fresh material. And then as things break down and as the fungi goes through its life cycle, mold can kind of move in. And that's often a succession situation. And so it can be the same within the soil with mycorrhizae. I've never thought about it in stages like that. That makes a ton of sense because, you know, you don't you don't see a, a dead tree just covered in mold instantly. There is like a, there are steps to it. That makes a ton of sense. That's cool. I want to go into another method that I saw on your website and we're going to put links to the video. So everything we're talking about, obviously there should be a visual component of our learning. If you're going to try any of this, you're going to want to see someone do it. <laughs> you guys have amazing videos on your website. We'll make sure to link them in the show notes. But as you know, a houseplant enthusiast turned gardeners, I loved the tutorial on how to grow mushrooms in containers. And it was very interesting that it, you were growing in almost what looked like a laundry basket. It was like this big plastic basket that had holes in it, similar to what our laundry basket looks like. You filled it up with the lasagna method with straw, I believe, and your spawn. And then the mushrooms were growing out of the holes in the pot. I'm a grow bag gardener, so I don't have a fenced in garden right now. We grow in grow bags on our balcony. And I was thinking, oh, well, maybe I could just do a couple of containers of mushrooms next to my grow bags. Can you walk our listeners through how you would do a simple container if they wanted to maybe pop a container at the corner of, you know, each garden bed or if they're like me and they're gardening in in small spaces? 
Yeah. So this comes back to the straw and the pasteurization method that I mentioned. For a higher success rate, it can be really great to do that pasteurization and you can fill up buckets and drill holes like half inch holes in those buckets and use that as a container. With more fresh airflow and rain kind of exposed to the natural environment more, you don't need to do that, especially if you're using a high spawn rate. Again, you can just layer the spawn, as you mentioned, with straw in a container and uh, keep it watered in a shady spot. I mean, the location that you're growing may not be the best. If it's perfect for tomatoes, it might not be perfect right on a, a balcony. Because it's going to be too bright. Because it might be just too bright and too okay. dry where the mushrooms may start to grow and they may just like quickly abort. They like the low down at the soil level. There is it's a very high humidity and that's higher than when you're standing, you know, where your head is pretty much always. And they're going to appreciate like, you know, 70, 80 90% humidity to form really well. If they're just getting fried by the sun, it's just not going to gonna work so great. So utilizing shade is really important. Okay, got it. And if I wanted to grow in a container, are the holes on the side of the container important? Or can I literally try growing in a nursery pot like with my plants and then the mushrooms would just grow in the top? You don't want unlimited surface area. You lose a lot of moisture. And the mushrooms don't know where to put their energy. So having a having confined growing areas is really important. Like that, I mentioned the bucket having half-inch holes, for example, because you really want the mushroom to form well and to form its n a nice cluster, for example, of oysters. It really needs to have like a defined space that it's growing out of. Think about like a crack in a tree or something along those lines. That's sort of what you're stimulating. So you really want to focus that growth through a few spaces. And finding the balance there, you know, can depend. There's no specific rule for that. But it can make harvesting really hard if everything's really low and small and spread out on a surface. Okay. So I could potentially have a nice, you know, eight-inch flower pot that I fill lasagna method with straw spawn, straw spawn. And then the mushrooms would just grow in the top of the pot, and I would just have a pot full of mushrooms instead of a pot with plants. So you're just talking about growing out of the top, not the side. Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. That whole thing will colonize as long as it's draining well and it's got the, yeah. the right conditions, and you will grow potentially right out of the top. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, leak anything, but there is, I have heard about some interesting projects with terracotta, you know, pots and using those in interesting ways, designing them for mushroom growing, essentially. Oh, that's so cool. We might even have one that would be good for that. That one that had all the little different pockets in it on the sides. Remember yeah. that pot? Oh, like a strawberry pot. That would be interesting. Yeah. <gasps> we're going to do that with our mushrooms this year. That'll be so fun. A strawberry pot. The strawberry pots have holes that, you know, you're supposed to grow your strawberries out of. So it has those nice controlled openings for mushrooms. Yeah. That'll be so fun to experiment with. That kind of thing can definitely work well. And if you have a pot that is porous, it's going to hold water and release water, which is really helpful and makes a lot of sense for outdoor use. For indoor use, you'd have to think to yourself, is this going to harbor contaminants? That's always what you're thinking about with indoor stuff. Outdoor stuff, it's just less of a factor because... There's so much going on outside. Yeah, because there's so much going on outside. Indoor is going to be such a wormhole. Separate episode. Yeah. We can't wait. We're so Separate excited. <laughs> what about maintenance? We've talked about straw bales, gardening in your garden bed, gardening next to your garden bed. What's our like daily, weekly, monthly maintenance throughout the gardening season that we need to think be thinking about for mushrooms? So let's look at a hypothetical garden, right? You've made two beds over in a nice shady, damp corner. And you've made a wine cap bed by itself. And you've made a almond agaricus bed. Two very differently constructed beds. 
the almond is going to be that mostly composted manure and the wine cap is going to be, let's say you used a mix of hardwood and straw, hardwood chips, slug, big one, deer are going to nibble on your stuff, squirrels, all sorts of things will go after your mushroom. Absolutely. It's food for them too. Probably the most powerful tool, and this can be utilized to help keep your mushroom shaded if you are going to use a really sunny area, is just agricultural cloth and creating low tunnels and providing some of that protection and, of course, fencing. But the pests will go after them. You should always, if you are planning on harvesting and maybe preserving things, you got to think to yourself sometimes, this can be more tricky. But if you've got mushrooms actively growing, like they've just started, and it's about to pour outside, you may want to cover them if you can. And 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 if you can get them out of the rain and, and maybe tarp it, those mushrooms, when they are fully grown, will keep better than if they're soaking wet when you harvest them. So that's an important consideration, especially that this always comes back to shiitake. It always comes back to shiitake. <laughs> <laughs> that's a book name for you right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that. If a mushroom is soaking wet, it's going to degrade faster. It won't have the shelf life that you want. So the timeline then, you inoculate perhaps two months later uh, after a rainy day, the mushrooms grow. Now, things can move along faster if you're supplementing with watering. You can pull or cut. This is important. It doesn't necessarily matter. But in terms of the survival of your bed, but you should always leave more material behind. That's always a better idea. And so cut, make sure of your identification, clean in the field, and then preserve. Cook and freeze, dry, put them in a paper bag in the fridge, usually good for about a week. And when you harvest, harvest young. Go for the younger mushrooms. When it comes to wine cap, they have a very prominent stem and cap. You want to ideally harvest before the cap has flattened out. That's an important one. Oysters too, at a point in their development, they flatten out and they also release a ton of spores. They're always releasing spores once those are exposed, but they release a ton at once and that will cause them to degrade much faster and reduce density. And that's what you want to go for before then. So you want to catch it before it starts to kind of tilt past its prime. Better to pull early than to pull late. Yeah, that is definitely the case. And you said cut versus pull. Can you explain that? While pulling is not damaging to the organism, it's important to leave as much material behind in your garden. I just feel like that is good practice. And you're also bringing less of a mess with you. Just like it makes the most sense to be sure of uh, your identification. When you're foraging, pulling can be very important. But when you're just harvesting what you know, it makes a lot of sense to just go out there with a really good pair of snips and just use the scissors to cut the mushrooms down, mow them down right at the base. And if you cut them at the base, do you think you can get a second flush? You could. One thing that you could do is you could pull the whole mushroom up. You could cut the base off and you could plant that base elsewhere to try and inoculate another area. You could use the bases of the mushrooms in that way. You certainly could. Smart. Wow. (laughs) There's two ways to look at that, right? Like, so you could use that to inoculate another bed or by leaving it behind, that material then degrades very fast into material that is more bioavailable. So that's your soil building right there is the material that you're leaving behind. The mushroom material will be, will have a lot of nutrients that's easier once that breaks down for the plants to get at. But it's not like a cut and come again flower where like if I cut it off, another one will shoot up right from where I had cut. No, it doesn't work that way. Got it. Once you're harvesting that mushroom, that part of the mushroom is done, but you've inoculated all this mycelium. Hopefully there's more mushrooms sprouting up around where, you know, the whole bed and you can use that base to inoculate elsewhere. Yeah. Just like apples off an apple tree. That's what you're doing. You're harvesting the fruit. Right. Because it's a fruiting body. Another apple doesn't grow. Okay. Okay. Here we go. That was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, of course. 
And so then you would take that material and inoculate elsewhere, for sure. You mentioned apples. We were talking about how temperature and humidity, obviously direct sunlight and temperature can kind of affect these mushrooms and humidity affects them as well. But are there certain kinds of mushrooms that are more hardy? Say I wanted to minimize my loss, right? I wanted to try one mushroom and optimize my my chance of success. You know, maybe I forgot to water for a day or maybe there was a hot snap. You know, is there one mushroom or one or two that you would say that have a lot of um, hardiness to them that are good options that kind of have some strength to variances in humidity and temperature above others? It's going to depend on the region that you live in. If you live in Maine and our last frost date isn't until mid-May, and we have such harsh winters, I probably wouldn't even bother planting pink oyster most of the time. You might because you're going to get it, but you're almost guaranteed not to get it multiple years in a row. It ain't going to survive the winters. So people that live down south, I am going to recommend hot weather tolerant mushrooms to them. So it does depend. But like, yeah, I might not recommend lion's mane for someone in Florida. Do you have a blog on your website that breaks down like the different mushrooms that people can grow in different garden zones or different climates? Yes, we do talk some about that. Okay, maybe we can include that in the link for this episode. Different ranges of temperatures for sure. But the hardiest mushrooms coming right back to the wine tap, it really is the corn of outdoor growing, followed very closely by the various oysters. They are really, really great in bed too and in containers, as we've mentioned. And then it starts to get more difficult and less predictable. It really does. You have the the almonds that do work very well. Bluets are a little more difficult. Chestnuts work well. And I'm Namico. You start to have species that are going to need, maybe perhaps are, are going to rely more on things being fresher or a higher spawn rate to give you a higher success or other methods like the log cultivation. Which, which we didn't even get to. We're at an hour. We have more questions for you. We did not talk about log cultivation, which is kind of a separate (laughs) beast in its own. I knew we were going to get caught up. I know, I knew it. It happens every time we get so excited. (laughs) And I know, but also it's like, there's so many, you know, as gardeners, so many questions, but there is a whole separate method to inoculating logs that takes a little bit more planning. You need, you know, specific wood, specific things. I'm going to say, why don't you just give us a teaser to like what that looks like? But I think the best thing is give us a teaser in this episode, but we're going to put the link to the video that you guys have on your website that walks you through every single step. It's very cool. It also, I know, can be make it more perennial, but can you kind of make a case for trying to grow in a log and why growing in logs might be fun for gardeners to, you know, add to their gardens? Yeah, if you're in a place with abundant hardwood and enough rain, shiitake mushrooms, sort of like wine caps, are really the gold standard. Shiitake in oak has been cultivated for thousands of years and is really predictable and can produce a lot of very delicious food for you over a number of years and should absolutely be considered. You can put a lot of effort into it or after that initial inoculation, you can set them and forget them and let the logs rot. You basically just drill holes in, in your log, put the spawn in, cover it with some wax. And you want fresh cut wood. Maybe your log is three feet long, six inches in diameter, and uh, you got some good music and maybe a beer. And you're you're off and running. Oh, I love all of I know. These Billy's areas. a woodworker. So I know I have log inoculation in my future because my husband is a woodworker. And yes. that's the project he's going to want to do. But yeah, it sounds like it's a little bit more lift up front, but then it's like more sustainable long term, like they keep coming back, right? Yeah, I think it's really amazing that aspect of them. Kind of the harder the wood that you use, the longer it may take to colonize, but the more it can produce overall. Like a strong white oak can produce seven, eight, nine years for real. Five or six is probably average. And you can dunk the logs and do what's called a forced fruiting and get a predictable crop every six to eight weeks. And that's shiitake, but you can also do chestnuts and oysters and you can do lion's mane 
And there are other ways to configure your logs, like the stump stack slash totem method, where you smush soda spawn in between layers of logs. And there are mushrooms that are going to want to be, have sort of a layer of woody material on top of them and, and be really, really close to the soil level. We call that the raft method and Namaco, um, and chestnut and piapino really like that. It really is, uh, phenomenal. And we find that some of the best culinary mushrooms out there really love law. Why the wax cap? What's the purpose of wax capping it? That's a great question because we do have plugs, right? So we have hardwood dowels that people can use or sawdust spawn. Sawdust spawn in both cases, you're putting wax on because it helps seal in moisture. It helps prevent critters from getting at it and it helps hold the material in place. It's really just a protective mechanism that is there for just the first several weeks. It all flakes off ultimately, but it's there just to help that mycelium jump off in the initial stages. And if it's sawdust spawn in particular, the sawdust spawn will just fall out and, and it'll get burrowed into. So it definitely is important if you're doing sawdust spawn and sawdust spawn is a more economical, better method for a larger number of logs. Oh, okay. Is there a certain kind of wax that you need to use or can I just take a candle and a lighter and kind of drip it onto there? <laughs> the last resort, sure, go for it. But you really want a wax that's going to be flexible. That's not just going to be really, really brittle and flake off when it gets hit with a raindrop, right? When you put it outside, we use a flexible paraffin cheese wax that when you get it nice and hot, it really kind of adheres and then soaks in and stays flexible. If you use a beeswax, you may even want to add a little bit of oil to the beeswax to make it more pliable. Um, and so thinking about that factor, the pliability of the wax will increase its effectiveness. Make sure it's food safe and biodegradable and all that. Yeah. All that jazz. Not like a Yankee candle. <laughs> that, that. <laughs> Scented candle. Yeah. What about frost dates? Do I have to wait to inoculate my garden after a frost date or can I inoculate before the frost date is over? It's going to depend on what you're trying to grow. There are a lot of things that are not very sensitive to the frost date and you should just inoculate around the frost date because when things are really frozen, things aren't going to grow. They're just not going to spread. They're going to be very dormant. But something like blue oyster, they don't care about us. Okay. Right around then is great. But if you're trying to inoculate something like almond or something like pink oyster, I would be more wary and make sure that that frost date is behind okay. you in your area. Okay. Good to know. And we'll definitely put all the links because you have so much detailed instructions. Yeah, I there. want to watch that and see. So, Billy, after this interview, what? How are we going to grow mushrooms this summer? What do you think? I want to try all of it. I don't see <laughs> any do. reason. Well, no, it's like thinking about it for a second, I kind of think about it almost like my obsession with Legos as a kid. It didn't just start with Legos, right? It started with just like regular blocks that I would stack up and try different things and build different things that I could I could still build some cool stuff out of that. Mm -hmm. But then I took it to the next level and I, you know, I used some Lincoln logs and I kind of stacked those together and I made some cool houses and things like that. And then, you know, when I got into Legos when I was a little bit older, I was building entire, you know, forests. And it that seems like what when this you got is. into woodworking when you were older. No, Legos. Oh, I got Legos? it. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> like this is the whole part that you don't even know about oh, me. I was okay. obsessed for years. Um, and I think most Gosh, of us still are. You learn something new about but, your husband every day, don't you? But honestly, like I want to try it all. I love the idea of having these small little buckets that I can, you know, go up to and, and just pull some mushrooms off for, you know, pasta at night or something like that. I want to kind of take ownership of uh, some mushroom bookends in some of the beds that you're going to build because I've always watched her build these beds and I've never really participated very much because I hate weeding, don't like gardening as much as she does. I like the picking the tomatoes and stuff like that, but I don't, I don't love the, the planting. Yeah, However, the eating part. you know, these mushrooms, it, it's getting me excited. And then honestly, the log method is something that I could just see being a multi-decade hobby that becomes a real passion project because it would be so cool just to be able to go out and, you know, pick some lines made off like of a, a hut log. or something like a log yeah. hut filled with mushrooms, Billy's mushroom hut. Yeah. I mean, you could build really like understanding the principles allows you to do so much experimentation here and play around with so many different formats. I always like to mention that this is pretty cutting edge stuff, guys. People have not been doing this 
that long with mushrooms. There's still a lot to learn, a lot of species that we can utilize. There's only a handful of books on this. How many books on gardening with plants are there? You know, uh, hundreds and hundreds. Um, and so playing around with it in different ways and using what you have is really going to yield interesting results and exciting results. I love it. Yeah. Even just thinking about garden beds that get lined with logs that are inoculated. That's a cool idea too. That's one of my favorite things to do. That's a hundred percent. Those logs, they're going to have less lifetime because they're right at the soil level yeah. and they may degrade faster, but they're also going to hold water better. And so you may want to colonize those normally, like above ground, stacked up with everything with your other logs or, or whatever. But ultimately, yeah, you could build a bed with those and have shiitakes fruiting all around your bed. That's the one we're doing. <laughs> That's the one I want to do. She's I'm decided. also I also definitely want to do the laundry basket method. I think that could be really fun with uh, just like in my, you know, in the shade. We have a shaded area of our balcony which I think that could be really fun to experiment with. You know, you could even have like a retaining wall kind of you talked about bookends and it got me thinking about you could even have like a sort of retaining wall and you could mound material to the end of a bed and you could have a whole lot going on in there. You could have that inoculated, that mound of material inoculated. You can inoculate compost piles. These people inoculate their own compost piles. And that can help break things down. And you're pulling food off your compost pile. There's a lot of cool things you can do with this. I'm not there yet. I'm not at the pulling food off my compost pile. But I'll, there. I'll marinate it. I'll, <laughs> the idea has been inoculated in my brain. We'll see if it fruits. Yeah. Oh, my God. That was such a good mushroom joke. Okay. How awesome is this? Billy and I are obviously trying. Where can people go to get some spawn and maybe learn more if they want to try and they can use code Growing Joy for a discount? Definitely use that code Growing Joy on Northspore.com. Under the shop tab, you can check out all the different spawn for outdoor growing. We primarily recommend sawdust spawn, and each product is going to explain what it's for and how it's used. If you have further questions, go under the learn tab and we have a bunch of walkthroughs. We have a bunch of YouTube videos. There are a, a lot of resources that we've made available through our website. But if you need to, reach out info at northspore.com and we'll help you find a method that works for you. The learn That's tab so is cool. amazing. I spent a lot of time there today prepping for this interview and I love the visual component. Like the visual component is super helpful and we're both visual learners, so visual it, learners. it makes a huge difference for us as well. The irony that I have a podcast, but um, <laughs> well, you don't have to memorize everything. There are some parts on there, guys. I don't necessarily memorize everything. I'm amazed at how much I have memorized, <laughs> but we have a chart lining up best species with best substrate. We have a, a chart talking about when to cut your logs if you're doing that. Uh, and, and it's all there for you to reference. Perfect. I love it. Amazing. Okay. This was amazing. Go to North Spore if you want to grow alongside us. Tag us on Instagram as well if you're going to be growing mushrooms. We want to see how you're doing. Code Growing Joy gets you, I think it's 10% off. Mm -hmm. Louis, you're the best. And I'm personally even more excited about growing indoors, our next episode. So sweet listeners, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the next episode because this is a four-part series. We're only 50% done. And the amount of information you've gifted us is absolutely incredible. We're so thankful yeah. to you, Louis. You're incredibly generous with your knowledge. Thank you so much. And honestly, it's, it's just so cool to get to talk to you again about this. I, I feel like every single time we've talked twice so far, and I feel like we only get to scratch the surface because there's still so mm -hmm. much that we could talk about. And it, this is just a blast. I can't wait for the next one. Thanks, guys. It's fun. And, you know, I, I am excited to see what mushrooms you guys grow. It's going to be awesome. Us too. <laughs> yeah. Take care. See you later. Well... There we go. That was Louie. I love him so much. He's just the best. He's so it, smart and nice and cool. Yeah. And honestly, I just <laughs> I could have kept talking to him for a long, long time. And every single time it's like, oh, my God, it, I'm glad that we have a couple more of these because every single time that we finish one of the conversations, I, I just kind of want to roll into the next topic. So it's good that I slow down. Good yeah. Way. Like, I wonder if he'll be our friend when this miniseries is over. <sighs> but that's just me being weird. OK, mushrooms in the garden. I'm so excited. After talking through this with him, I'm grow bag gardening still on our balcony. And so I'm thinking that 
I want to kind of try this container method growing in containers, like in the laundry basket we were talking about on our balcony. I love that idea. And then maybe I might employ you to try the tree stump method. But I think that's the method that I'm really interested in trying because oh, honestly, good. I think I it's something I thought I was going to have to bully you into it. <laughs> you can't bully me to do anything, especially when it comes Fair. to mushrooms. I just get excited. <laughs> I think that it is something that, you know, you could have these logs for, you know, a long, long time yeah. and to be able to treat them. And honestly, it feels nice about sort of reintegrating them back into the surrounding environment because the, the mushrooms are eventually going to break down everything around them. So yeah. It seems like uh, sort of helping nature along, especially with all of the fallen logs and stumps and mm-hmm. stuff that's happened around here. So it's definitely an option I'm interested in. I know as it's spring, we were just talking about how we want to start our daily walks again. Mm-hmm. And those daily walks in the local forest um, is where our love for mushrooms started because that's where we came up with our shroomy, shroomy, shrooms theme song. And that's where our kind of curiosity about this started. So it feels very cyclical that we're doing this series now a year after our budding interest. For lack yeah, of a I can't word. wait for the snow to melt and for us to just traipse through the mud and check out all the yeah. new life that starts to spring up. It's going to be a really wonderful time. It's going to be awesome. Well, thank you, Billy, for co-hosting this with me. Thank you, North Spore. If you're interested in getting any of the products we talked about and growing your own mushrooms, whether indoor or outdoor, North Spore has everything you need, northspore.com, and then code Growing Joy for 10% off at checkout. They're hooking you up with a discount. And thanks, Louie. We love you. Okay. Thanks, Louie. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. 
There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key Plant Parent Personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, A mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However, that drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 